On behalf of the Center for Family Care, we welcome you to our webinar on Light in Times of Darkness. If you're with us for the first time, please know that the program is recorded. Um, in about a couple days, you can go on to the website or Facebook page and you'll see the program there archived. I say that because I know we have some parents in the audience and things happen. You may have to step away. Also, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little Q&A envelope. Um, we hope that you'll ask questions throughout this program and we'll do our very best to get some answers to you before we end. A huge thank you to Leadership 100 for making these webinars possible. The topic today is an opportunity for all of us. Um, how to be a light in times of darkness. Now, historians would say this is probably not the darkest time in human history, but in our era, it's not really sunny. COVID has actually played a real havoc with so many of our lives. Some people are losing jobs. Colleges and schools are having a hard time actually teaching in person. Our churches are just a fraction filled. And perhaps the most painful is the fact that we're isolated. We don't have the freedom to see the people we love. Throw a contentious election on top of that dark? I would say yes. But that's why we're happy to have um, Father Anthony Yaji with us to encourage us to find the most important light, the light of Jesus Christ. How do we do that? How do we become lights and how, how do we help our families spread light to those around us? Father Anthony is the pastor at St. George Antiochian Orthodox Church in Fishers, Indiana outside of Indianapolis. And for the last 14 years, he was the director of the Antiochian village camp in Pennsylvania. Uh, he has held many national youth program uh, leadership roles, OCF, um, uh, Teen Soyo, uh, so many different camping programs all around the country. And in addition, he has navigated through some really personal dark times where he had to be a light. I asked my adult children who were Antiochian village counselors and listened to quite a few of really great speakers, who would be a good person to talk on this topic? And hands down, they all said Father Anthony. But this is the important part. They said, Mom, not so much for what he says, but how he lives his life. We're so happy to have you here today, Father Anthony. Welcome. Thanks, Cindy. It's great to be here. I don't deserve all those flattering comments, but thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, Father Anthony and I were uh, did a lot of youth work together for a lot of years, about 100 years ago. Right, Father? We, we were did. a little more youthful then. <laughs> exactly. We did. We uh, were blessed to be advisors for Midwest Soyo together for about 10 years. I thoroughly enjoyed the ministry and learning from you. It was great. It was great work together. Let's get right into our topic. Mari did an excellent job finding a beautiful image uh, when she was doing the promotional work for this webinar. It was uh, a set of hands and it was in complete darkness and it was holding a light that was shining. So Father, what would you say about that image and where we are today in our world? Well, as you mentioned in the introduction, there's so much that's happening in the world. It seems like chaos is reigning in so many ways. Um, but we have to remember that there is hope. There's light. It's the light of Jesus Christ. And even though it seems like we're being sucked into a black hole um, in outer space, uh, it's the farthest thing from the truth because we know that the light of Christ illumines all and gives us a path to salvation and a way through even the most challenging moments. As a matter of fact, I'd even venture to say that instead of looking at these things as challenges, we need to look at them as opportunities. Opportunities to just be more faithful in Christ, knowing that he is the one that's gonna help us through it all. Opportunities to trust in one another um, and to lift each other up. And so it's a way we can respond positively instead of worrying about the negative side of things. So well said. You know, because I have known you for a number of years, I know that you have lived a life that exemplifies uh, being a light in darkness. 
Would you share a few of your experiences with us and how you found light in those times? Sure. Um, as you well know, Cindy, but for the benefit of everybody else, um, I've actually felt like I've lived a very blessed life um, in so many ways. But um, I have three children. And when my middle child, Mark, um, was born, he was born um, with Down syndrome and a hole in his heart. Um, and it was quite a surprise um, to us because we had no way of knowing <laughs> that he was going to have these conditions. And so the day he was born, we found out immediately the suspicions of the pediatrician, and he was taken up to um, Indianapolis. We were living in Terre Haute at the time. So long story short <laughs> is that at one year old, um, he had to have open heart surgery. Um, and to show you how the light of Christ shines forth from all this, the surgeon decided that his surgery was going to be on April 25th, which happens to be the Feast of St. Mark, mm. my son's patron saint. And at that point, when the doctor had made the decision, I knew everything was going to be fine because God was the one in control. And that's, I think, how we see the light shine through in so many ways. So that struggle that we, my, my wife and I had originally, it kind of was eased tremendously by just that simple fact. Um, Mark is a, a tremendous young man. He is now uh, 30 years old and is a very pious and holy young man. Uh, he's nonverbal, but I, I give you an image of how he has been a light in my life. And it's, I think, the light of Christ shining through him. And when I was assigned to go to the Antiochian village, I went out there to be the camp director. And my family stayed in Terre Haute, as you know, Cindy. Um, and so when I was there, I came back one Sunday um, to visit with my family. And I decided not to serve because I didn't want to get in the way of the priest who had taken over for me. So I sang in the choir. And we're going through liturgy. And we're starting to sing Holy God. And all of a sudden, Mark, um, and so he's got Down syndrome, which means he is um, slower in his mental processing of things. Uh, he noticed that the gentleman who normally reads the epistle wasn't in church that Sunday. So he walks up to the chanter stand, grabs the epistle book, comes back to me in the choir, puts the book in my hand and points for me to go up to the front of the church to read the epistle. Now, mind you, the hundred other people in church, um, nobody even had it on their radar. But here's this young man, uh, you know, and the child shall leave them, uh, who was about 18 at the time with his mental diminished capacity. He was the one leading us in our faith. Um, and it just was remarkable um, to see how he let that light shine forth. Um, what a great example that is. And what people don't know is when you were a teenager uh, in Teen Soyo, you and your cousin started um, Special Olympics camp uh, for the Antiochians in Pennsylvania. I mean, I just think that's so providential. And at that time, you had no idea you were going to be um, a father of a Down syndrome child and how this has come full circle. He actually participated uh, in the Special Olympics camp, didn't he? He did. Yeah, it, it is amazing because I was an accounting major. Um, we started this outreach uh, for something for the young people of Soyo to participate in. And through that experience, it caused me to change majors to special education. I briefly taught for a little while and then had to help in a family business. Um, but it all prepared me to be a, a better parent to my son and help him navigate through the educational system as well as his entire life. And that's how, you know, we can look and see God working in our lives constantly like that. And that's the light that shines from the darkness. Mm. You know, a couple other things, Cindy, and, and you know, um, 1997 was a rough year for me and my family. Um, in March, uh, my spiritual father, Father Joseph Olas, passed away, and that was a big blow to me um, to lose my spiritual father, uh, who also was mentoring me as a young priest at the time um, and everything. And then just a month and a half later, uh, my own father um, died. He was visiting uh, my family in Indiana with my mom, and they were there for Holy Week and Pascha, and my brother also came up and was restored to the life of the church and his uh, fiance was um, chrismated and his uh, soon to be stepson was baptized. And on, whole, on bright Tuesday on the way home, my parents were in a car accident and my father was killed. And it was a 
really rough time for me after having lost my spiritual father, then my father. And then fast forwarding, still in 1997, um, in, on November 9th, my father-in-law um, also passed away. So in that one year, actually less than a year, I lost the three fathers of my life, uh, my spiritual father, my biological father, and my father-in-law. And through it all, though I never doubted God's love, um, I actually knew that all three of those men were in God's care. Um, and it allowed me to continue to move forward in my life, even in their absence. And I still um, think they're present with me all the time. And then one more last kind of challenging moment, <clears throat> or really an opportunity, was when 1997, on the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul, um, I was serving liturgy at the Antiochian village. And we got to the point of the sermon, and one of the other priests that was serving with me was preaching. I got called out of the altar um, to call the state police uh, because there was an emergency with my wife. I called and was told that I needed to hurry up and get to the hospital. They had rushed my wife um, to the hospital, and it didn't look good. And she had actually passed away uh, before she ever got to the hospital. And so that was another blow <coughs> uh, to me and my family, so to speak. But I, I say a blow because it, the emotional and mental impact initially was difficult. But um, really, what carried us through that was our hope in Christ and the resurrection and the resurrection of, of us all. Um, and then the encouragement and the support of my bishops, lots of clergy, um, all my family and friends. Um, and Cindy, you were a big help in one of those moments when my parents got in a car accident and I had to rush to Washington, D.C. You flew down and helped uh, Stephanie take care of the kids while I was in Washington taking care of my mom. It, it's those moments of Christian living that you see in other people that can help really inspire us and know that, that there is hope and there's light and it comes through Jesus Christ and those who love him. Mm, that's amazing. Kudia Stephanie was an amazing woman, an Orthodox author, a professor, a musician. We miss her terribly these last couple of years. And your remarks about how you made it through those periods of time is they're really exemplary for all of us. You know, I think about um, <clears throat> your time at the Antiochian village. Um, you know, I was, I was kind of doing some rough calculating with about 1,200 kids there a year for 14 years with winter camp, summer camp, and all the counselors. And it's like 20,000 kids that you kind of were exposed to and had the opportunity to, to influence, um, you know, maybe tell us a little bit about that. Sure. You know, it is truly a blessing to be around young people because they have life, energy, excitement, um, and they're also looking, and at least our experience has been at camp and even working with SOYO, and I'm sure it's the same with, you know, the youth movements throughout all of our churches and our camping programs. They're thirsting and searching um, for answers, but also the right way to live their life. And so we have tried to um, model them to become lights, um, mm -hmm. to let the light of Christ shine not only in their life, but that they take that light way beyond um, the Antiochian village, for example, into their parishes, into their communities, into their schools, and be an example and a model. Because, you know, there are a lot of people who are never going to pick up scripture. But what we say is that the only scripture they read might be in the way we're living our lives and the way they look at us and they see the joy that we live with, even in the midst of challenging moments. And so we um, have been able to work with our young people to kind of nurture that. As a matter of fact, one of the activities that uh, our counselors came up with is this exercise with the campers where they each would hold a candle and they'd light their candle and they'd be told, blow out your candle. And of course, you know, one quick puff of the candle and boom, it was out. Then they relit all the candles and they said, okay, as a group, come bring your candles together and hold them as one flame. And so you had this one big flame um, from you know, what could have been 20 candles. And then when one person would try to blow it out, it couldn't blow it out. And so we helped kind of create um, within that a spirit of understanding that they're not in this struggle alone, um, that they are living this life with Christ first and foremost, that he's present with them, but they have one another. They have their spiritual fathers, spiritual mothers, parents, godparents, grandparents, a whole network of people that help keep that flame burning bright. So when they're challenged at 
times when they're facing difficult decisions, they have people to turn to, people to strengthen them in making the right decision in their life. Uh, it really is kind of an incredible um, opportunity. And so in, in our camping programs, um, you know, we're helping to facilitate that, that our young people can be lights to the world. And I think it's needed more now than ever. Wow. I remember before COVID you telling me that that was a vision of, uh, of, of yours and of the camps to help these lights go out and mold the kids into lights. I love that um, example with the, the candle. That is such, that I hope we can use that many times over because it really does make that point and, and help, help everybody do that kind of thing. So, well, you know, when I think about um, creating uh, uh, lights, uh, there is no group that needs the help more than our parents these days. Um, you know, parents, godparents, grandparents, you, you listed the whole group. How can we help our parents help our kids be lights? Um, so I, I think there's a lot of um, opportunities. And if you'll let me, I want to share, um, and I'm going to put it here in the, um, in the chat for everybody, a, a quote that I'd like to um, share with you. And it's a, a quote from Al Rossi's book called All is Well. Um, it's a brand new book just published. Um, and it's about how um, he uses the metaphor of a lake. And I'm just going to read this short quote to you, if I may. It says, one metaphor for the human mind is a lake in the woods. The surface of the lake changes with the weather. Some days the surface is placid and serene. Some days the surface is raucous with waves that could topple a canoe. Some days the surface is frozen solid. Below the surface at mid-level, the water is more stabilized. At the bottom of the lake, the water is calm and unchanging. That's my own experience. Much of the time, I have intense surface of the lake mental warfare. At the same time, I have a deep peace about it all, aware that Christ is doing for me what I can't do for myself. And what I take from that and what I'd like to share um, with those who are listening is to realize that before we can deal with all the issues we have to face as parents, um, we have to first kind of focus a little bit on ourselves and find that inner peace, find that water at the bottom of the lake, um, that inner peace that allows us to stay calm when everything else about us is in the midst of chaos. And that, again, as I said, is really true in, in this day and age. But another practical thing of advice here is um, an important thing for us to remember as parents is as much as we love our children, you can't love your children unless you're loving your spouse and putting your spouse first. It's all about putting that other person first. And so as a husband, I should have put my wife first. And as I do that and care and love for her, then I can actually appropriately care and love for my children as well. Um, I think that helps us then to really nurture our children when they see us imitating Christ's love to the people in our lives, first and foremost, our spouse, and then our children, um, they get that message of love. And then they can emanate that in the world. Because right now, there's just too much anger and hatred in the world. As a matter of fact, um, I, I want to share a quick quote with you also that um, it, it's from Martin Luther King Jr. And I saw this on a recent visit uh, to his uh, monument that's in Washington, D.C. And they have engraved on a stone that says, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And I think we can create in our families a sense of love, in our children a sense of love that goes beyond the hatred that exists in this world, the, the political um, sides that are dividing the country. We need to bring people back together. And we need to start within our own homes, parents loving one another, parents loving their children, and then the children and us as parents going out in the world and being that uh, light and ray of hope through the love and unconditional love of Jesus Christ. Hmm. Those are amazing ideas. One of, uh, one of the things you said about putting your spouse first, someone actually said that at a baby shower for me when asking for advice about being a parent, they said, put your husband first and then you'll have two strong, strong parents for the kids. Uh, but you don't have to say as a parent, I think it's so important that 
drive out the darkness piece because if our hearts are full of darkness for all the things that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, at the end of the day, it's hard for any light to shine. So, you know, what are some ways that we can drive that darkness out of our hearts? Because quite frankly, it doesn't take much to get it in there. And as parents, we sort of have to be so cognizant of what is in us as we're with our kids. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, it starts by us attending to our own spiritual lives um, and, and focusing on developing that. Um, so it means we have to be um, sacramentally active, attending the liturgical life of the church, reading scripture, um, praying on a daily basis. And, and we can never underestimate the power of prayer. Um, even the medical profession is discovering that there are some things that are happening, healings that are happening that can't be explained. And in large part is because the, the prayers that are going on for that person, and I've heard doctors attribute healing um, only by the grace of God. But the other part of it is to get rid of the darkness in our own lives is we have to be sacramentally active in a sacrament of confession, seeking mm -hmm. God's forgiveness and the forgiveness of one another. Um, because we have to drive out the darkness, as you said. And the only way to do that is with God's help. When we come to confession, we offer all these sins and our shortcomings um, over to him, and he wipes the slate clean. And then it's like, like pure, clean, white board, like our white baptismal garment is being put on all over again. And that way we can be bright and, and as a light to other people. And that's the best way to get rid of the darkness in our own lives is through the sacrament of confession. So once again, we need to do that ourselves in order to get rid of that before we can even help our kids and then really help our kids see that that is something that our church offers as a way to get rid of that darkness and to really help them get into a sacra sacramental confession life on yeah, a regular basis. Exactly, Cindy. We need to model um, what we expect in our children. So if, if, as a father, if I'm not going to confession, if I'm not receiving the sacraments, if I'm not going to church, why should I expect my children to do the same thing? So we have to be the saints in our children's lives. We have to be the example of sainthood in our children's lives. And explain to them when we fall short, we go and we ask forgiveness. And, and that's okay, as long as we're going to ask forgiveness um, after we've fallen short of the mark. That's a really great point. And I love that idea, um, Martin Luther King. I, I had heard something similar attributed to St. Basil. Um, and I'm trying to remember, uh, if our heart is pure, full of love, full of forgiveness and humility, then we are filled with light. God is light. The Holy Spirit is light. If, however, our hearts are obscured by prejudice, hatred, lust, self-conceit, and jealousy, then we will be full of darkness. So attending to our own whites, you know, cleaning our, our slate. My husband, Paul, we said every time our kids took communion and we'd be in the car, don't you feel so pure? Don't you feel so light? And you know, it's a great reminder to all of us that that is what happens every time. It's such a big deal. You know, I can't help but smiling big because I can hear Paul saying that. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and the purity of his heart, you know, offering those comments really is an inspiration. I, I have to tell you, um, you know, an, another thing that's been an inspiration to me is watching families live the life the right way. And I'll never forget a visit uh, with you, Cindy, and, and, and Paul and your family when I was invited to, to a family camp. And I was with you for a couple of days and watching your family gather around your um, icon corner and pray together and having the children um, leading the prayers and everything it was a powerful moment for me spiritually um, as a priest and as a father to see a family living that way. And I don't say it to, to kind of boost you up, but it was just a really a practical example of, of one way that we as families um, should be living our lives. I think there's a couple other things too um, that we might be able to do to be lights, if I may. Mm. Um, you know, I was talking with a parishioner uh, just a couple of days ago and, you know, the advice now is in Thanksgiving is be careful about having, you know, large families gather together, um, you know, to, because of social distancing and everything else. And so this, this one uh, parishioner who is, she and her husband, um, just living on their own now and their children have families of their own, they've decided they're not doing the big traditional 
family Thanksgiving, but she wanted to um, do something that I thought was remarkable. What she wanted to do is still prepare that big, huge family meal and take it to a family in our parish who might not otherwise have such a meal. Um, and so here was an example of light in my life and hearing from one of my own parishioners who's going to do that, who's going to prepare a Thanksgiving meal and deliver it to another family um, who probably wouldn't be able to have the big turkey and all the other fixings. Um, so I think that's another way that we can um, make our lives radiate light, the light of Christ that can shine from us. Um, that's such a, it's such a great idea. And you think about, there are probably plenty of people who could use a meal. And uh, even in our own parishes, people who have lots of little children and are having everything they could do just to, to keep together. Uh, it's a great idea. What are some other ways that families can actually uh, be lights? Because that is an important piece of what we want to talk about. Yeah, so I, I think, um, you know, the whole notion again of praying together is an important thing. Um, but also, it's important for us as parents um, to emanate a sense of calm, a sense of peace. I remember I said finding that, that deep water within us. Um, because there's so much going on, um, it creates a sense of anxiety among a lot of people. Um, and, I, and I hate to say it, but I think the media um, feeds into a lot of that, for lack of a better word, fear mongering um, and things like that. It creates um, a lot of sense of unease. But we have to find this sense of calm, of Christ residing within us. So to do that, we need to be praying. But we also need to spend time in silence. We need to spend time apart um, so that we can feel that sense of calm and let the calm of Christ's peace reside within us. And then if we can portray that to our children, it gives them a sense of, okay, everything's going to be okay. Look, mom and dad, they're fine with things. Um, you know, I can be fine with it too. And I can handle the anxiety and stress of life because Christ is our hope. Christ is our trust. He's the one that will help us rise above all these things. I think those are a couple of, of valuable things that families can start implementing but again, it all starts with us as parents, first making these things real in our own personal lives before we make it real um, in the lives of our children. Well, you know, it's just so practical. And to think about making sure that we're showing calm and letting them know election results, running out of toilet paper, whatever the topic is, that God is with us. And, um, you know, we don't have to worry about these worldly cares, that God will, will be with us. You know, you know, oh, go ahead. I, if I can mention, you know, yeah. I referred to the, the point when my wife had passed away um, and trying to find that sense of calm uh, was an important thing, for, especially for my children. And I don't think he'll mind me sharing this. My son, Matthew, was having a difficult time um, because he loved his mom dearly and they had a unique and special relationship. Um, and Matthew lives in New York. And when he one day when he was struggling, he went out of his apartment and right there on the street, I wish I could have shown you the image, but right there on the street, somebody had taken sidewalk chalk and written this image um, as he passed it. It said, you are going to make it. Trust God and keep praying. It was as if God wrote that himself for Matthew to see that. And he said, all of a sudden, he had this sense of calm and peace about him. We know, we never know where we're going to hear the word of God, where we're going to see God. Um, we should be seeing him in everyone. Uh, but here was an example for my son Matthew, where God gave him this message to help set his life at peace in that given moment when he needed it the most. Wow, that's amazing. I love that story. And it is, it is true for all of us. We all just need to remember anytime we walk out of anywhere, look for that sidewalk chalk with that message. You know, speaking of messages, there is another quote that I've heard you say about um, uh, faith. Would you mind sharing that? Because I just think everybody needs to hear it and we're going to put it in the chat box so people can can remember this sure um i don't recall where i first heard it but um the saying is faith is not about everything being okay or turning out okay um, faith is about being okay no matter how things turn out so if i can let me let me repeat it one more time um, faith is not about everything turning out okay Faith is about being okay, no matter how things turn out. And, you know, we can see clearly um, 
whoever would have planned for this year, 2020, the way it's unfolding. Um, but for us, having faith in Christ means everything's going to be okay. You know, God's going to prevail on this. We are going to prevail with Christ in all of this. And we'll come out better on the other side, whatever that other side is, wherever it might be, whenever it might be. And we have to be willing to do that. Just turn everything over and trust in God. Those are wise words. And I'm going to remember that one for sure. Well, as we're getting close to the end of our talk, and we're going to start looking at some of the questions that have come, Father, will you just kind of summarize for us and give us a couple, two or three, whatever the number, practical pieces of advice as we, as we move on? Sure. Um, so first of all, I think it's been a joy to be here with you today. But I think if we can take away a couple things from all of this is remember, first of all, that God's in charge. Secondly, um, to find the discipline within our own lives, um, to let our focus be on Christ, not all the other things that are happening around us, because that's the work of the devil, putting these temptations in our way. If we focus on Christ, then everything else falls into place. And no matter how things shake out in the big picture of things, we are in the right place spiritually, um, which is the most important thing for our salvation and the salvation of those around us. Uh, it's been said, um, and I apologize, I just had a slip of the mind of, of the saint that offered it, but the idea of the general notion is save ourselves and thousands around us will be saved. Um, that, that idea that we have to really pursue our own salvation, um, that will lead to others um, finding salvation as well. So we can't be a light until we find the light within ourselves, and that comes through prayer, through silence, through the sense of calm. Um, through scriptural reading, the reading of other spiritual books, like the book I mentioned, All Is Well, kind of an appropriate thing for the day and age we're in, through listening to the podcasts that exist, uh, both through our jurisdictions um, and the wonderful ministries they have, or places like OCN or Ancient Faith Ministry. Um, there's so much out there to fill us with the light of Christ um, that will block out all the darkness and overpower the darkness and allow us to live a healthy um, life and find our way to Christ. That's beautiful, Father. Let's take a look at some of the questions that have come in since we've started. Um, I've got one here. Father, with your experience with special needs, both educationally and in your family, what advice can you give caregivers as they endure grief over losses of expectations? You know, There's um, another one, but I'll let you finish that and then we'll, sure. we'll uh, go back to the second question. So, you know, um, what I didn't share with you is when, um, even though I had a special education background when my son, Mark, was born, they immediately rushed him up to Indianapolis um, to Children's Riley, Riley's Children's Hospital. And I remember driving I-70, it's about a 70 mile drive. Um, and I remember driving in the car and crying and shedding tears about um, all kinds of things. I mean, things running through my head of a child who's one day old and thinking, well, he's never going to be the president of the United States. He's never going to have a child of his own. He's never going to, he's never going to, he's never going to. And I realized that was silly to worry about the nevers. Uh, instead, what I needed to do is focus on what he can do, what he should be able to do, and what, more importantly, what I can do to help him grow. Um, so it's a matter of wiping away the expectations and instead filling um, our minds and our hearts with what should I be doing? and seeking the advice of people who have walked this path before, finding the right authorities, the right um, educational resources, the right uh, medical resources and things um, to make that happen. Because I will tell you this, um, that uh, I, I had doubts um, those first couple of days. I, I was doubting in my mind, what did my wife and I do that our son should be born this way? I mean, that was kind of the darkness that was overshadowing me. Um, and it was happened to be the Sunday before um, the gospel of the man born blind. And I had to prepare my sermon. And as I was wrestling with these ideas, I'm reading the scriptures, preparing my sermon. And the apostles were asking Jesus, what sin did this man commit or his parents commit that he should be born blind? And, I and Christ said, so the glory of God might be made known through him because God was going to heal him. Um, those thoughts were going through my own head at the time. And I realized that God in all his glory is going to use Mark in some way. And he has. I gave you the example of the epistle um, 
reading and everything. Uh, but also the idea that um, Mark is probably a man of faith, even his diminished capacity of sorts, um, way beyond most of the people I know. Uh, I would even dare to say that in some way he's a saint, um, a walking saint, uh, because of his piety and his faithfulness to the church. That's the one place if he was able to live the rest of his life in one place only, it would be inside the church for all the liturgical services or in a monastery. Um, so I think for us, what we need to do is not focus on expectations, kind of get rid of the expectations, but see what you can do for your child in that moment of, of their life. I mean, in that given moment, you look a little down the road of what else you need to do to plan and to prepare for them to grow healthy and grow well. And I think the first and foremost thing is a life in Christ. Um, and truly, that's what happened with Mark. Um, we brought him to every service. And as a priest, he got to a lot of services. And he found a great joy and love for being there. I think God touched his heart in a unique way. And I believe um, in many ways, if we look, we're going to see uh, people who have special needs have been touched uniquely by God, blessed, I would say, by God in ways that, that I will never experience. Um, so I would suggest, um, you know, as you struggle with that grief, look to the hope, look to the resurrection, look to how God has blessed you with a life that is dear and rich and that you're going to cherish. And the last thing I would say on this is that um, I've told people this numerous times. If Mark could be born all over again without Down syndrome, um, I would say to God, no, you know, for whatever reason this happened, it's been a blessing in Mark's life, a blessing in my life, uh, and in the lives of so many thousands of people who Mark have encountered. Um, and so um, let us be thankful for what we have, for the blessings that we have in each and every life that we get to encounter, especially in our own children. Wow, that was beautiful, Father. I know that that answer is going to be helpful to so many people who are listening. Um, the, another question is, how can parish communities be more intentional about embracing families with special needs? Um, so a great question. Um, there is a really, I think, valuable resource um, that is done by Faith Tree Ministries. It's called, it's a book called Removing Barriers. Um, and a bunch of people were brought in together who have specialties that lend itself to this. And I have a feeling Cindy's going to grab the book. I don't have mine handy nearby right now. Um, but this book, Removing Barriers, addresses how parishes can help um, their parish acclimate uh, to people with special needs. Um, I, I knew it, Cindy was going to grab the book there, um, but th there's, there's some wonderful resources in there uh, of what we can do in parish life. Um, you know, in some ways, we all have a special need. I mean, I'm wearing glasses. That's a special need. Um, some people don't hear as well. Um, so for those who can't hear as well, we add amplification into our churches so everybody can hear, or we, or we find those um, sets of earphones that can be utilized to help hear the priest a little bit better or the deacon better or whatever it might be. Um, I would suggest that we also get the people in the parish more active in the lives of those people with special needs in the parish. You know, one of the great testimonies of what happened in my days in Terre Haute were how the, the parishioners embraced Mark as one of their own um, children. Um, because he was around all the time, and, and they loved him and nurtured him, and, and he actually just emanated love all the time because he didn't know a stranger, doesn't know a stranger, and always embraced them, you know, in a loving hug and everything. Matter of fact, to the point where we had to kind of try to teach him some normal um, social boundaries, uh, but I think in our parishes, we need to expose them, we need to teach them, we need to offer them in a loving way how they can be um, a little bit more accommodating, I'll give you another example. When I took over the Antiochian village, um, nut allergies were just on the rise. And I went through a lot of training through some different camping programs. And, you know, I was hearing about these other camps who made their camps nut free. Um, and I thought, well, wow, that's a big sacrifice to make for the entire camp just because a few kids can't have some nuts. And after a short period of time, I realized, well, wait a minute it's easy to do that. Let's get rid of the nuts. Let's get rid of those allergens um, so that all kids can enjoy camp. And it wasn't a big deal. It really isn't. So I think even in ways like that in our parish, you know, um, let's be mindful of even those kind of things, some of those food allergy type things. And let's not have 
certain things in there that we don't need to have. Um, you know, we can do without nuts for a coffee hour or a, a particular meal or something like that to make sure that everyone is safe and healthy and well. The same thing is true with our spiritual lives. We need to make the accommodations we need to make to make sure everyone can pray with us. If that means making sure you add a ramp outside your church so those who have wheelchairs can get into church, then we need to do that no matter what the cost, because no cost is too great to ensure that one person can attend services and find salvation through the church. That's a great answer. And yes, I did go get the book. It's called Removing Barriers. It's from Faith Tree. You can find it at faithtree.org. Really good stuff. I think it's, it would be very helpful to anyone who's asked the question. We have another question. Um, I struggle to pray daily on my own. Do you have any advice for practical practice? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, uh, I'll, I'll give you the best I can. Um, I had that struggle myself, um, and I'm a priest. I know it, it sounds kind of odd to hear that, um, but I will tell you, um, we can find resources that work for us. First of all, we need to find a time that works for us. Um, I know a person, I'm not going to mention this person by name, but she gets up at five in the morning so she can have her time alone to pray. Now, I'm not saying that works for everybody, but if it means getting up a little bit earlier just so we're up ahead of the family so we can pray, then let it be. The problem is, and I just had a conversation just today with a parishioner who said, you know, in the midst of when trying to pray at home, there's all these other thoughts about what I should be doing and things like that that get in the way. And we need to have a sense of calm. We need to find that peace. We need to find that quiet time, that silence, where we can block out everything else. Um, one of the great things that I have found beneficial for my own salvation, um, and it sounds kind of odd because I'm talking about a smartphone, is the daily readings from the Greek archdiocese. Um, I use it faithfully in my life every single morning to get my daily scripture readings, to read about the saints, and to begin my prayer life. Because when I start with scripture, then that helps get me in the right frame of mind that allows me some time then to pray. So I think that that's uh, you know, one way to do it. Um, but you have to set aside time for yourself in order to do it. And whether it's getting up a little early, staying up a little late, carving out some uh, niche of time that works for you and your life. And then don't be shy to tell your family, look, this is mom's time or dad's time um, for my prayer and my communicating with God. So this 15 minutes is mine. If it's 12 to 12, 15 or whenever it is, um, you know, just ask your family to respect that time. And then you can hopefully maybe focus a little bit and not have to worry about what are they doing now or what do I need to do um, as soon as I'm done with this. You know, when you think about it, Father, if you think about as a parent, the most important thing we can do is fill ourselves with that light there's no excuse for us not doing it. I, you know, I just think it's a really good goal if you think about it from a parent standpoint. It, it um, is, Cindy. And, and one of the things I would suggest is, you know, talk to your spiritual father or spiritual mother about, you know, a, a prayer rule for you. Um, I always believe in starting out small and simple until you get in the habit of it and you get comfortable with it, and then you can build it. Uh, but seek the advice of, you know, those around you um, who seem to be successful in that, and maybe they can help guide you um, and check in with you on a regular basis on that. Okay, I have the last question, and uh, I almost hate to ask it, but it is something that everybody's got on their mind. Um, any advice on how families can be a light during the election and the aftermath? <laughs> you know, I'm more fearful of the aftermath than, than, than the election itself um, right now. But that having been said, um, I, I think it's important um, for us to talk to our children because they're getting inundated with it just like we are. Um, as a matter of fact, I just discovered yesterday how to block out some of this stuff um, off of Facebook um, with regard to that. Um, but I think it's important that we talk to our children about how we're suppo supposed to treat one another, how we're supposed to love one another, how we're supposed to lift each other up. Um, you know, it's a shame that our political world has gotten us to the point where instead of me talking about all of what I'm capable of doing and what I'm promising to do and what I can do, we're hearing all these attacks about who I'm running against. Um, and so we need to teach our children that that's not how we proceed with our life. We need to be light. 
not shedding darkness in the world, but light and lifting up those things and enhancing those things which are good in our lives. Um, so the idea that, um, you know, we have this process that exists, nothing, I don't think anything's going to change that process. Um, so we have to let our children know that they should grow up as responsible citizens to kind of understand what's happening in the world, to be responsible citizens to one day vote when they have the opportunity to vote, to let their voice be heard in that regard, but to look for the best in everybody and, and look at how we can make a difference in the world. Because I believe, um, and this is just my belief, not the church's belief, my belief, politicians are not going to change the world. We faithful Christians we faithful Christians are, being, are going to be the light in the world that's going to make the difference, that's going to bring salvation to the world through Jesus Christ, not an elected politician from one party or another. So we are the light of the world as Christ shines within us. Christ is the light, and we can reflect that light and be lights to others so that we can move beyond this present darkness. That's a perfect way for us to sign off. Thank you so much, Father Anthony, for your loving words of advice to all of us. We, may we even take one or two of your suggestions and use them. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, we look forward to visiting with you on other topics in the future. Feel free to look through our archives when you're needing a little boost on other topics. We thank you very much. God bless.